Welcome to the Mirror Talks podcast, where we deconstruct some of humanity's most disconnecting and limiting assumptions and offer an alternative, a free state of consciousness, unbiased, naturally wise, and genuinely loving. We will shed a more enlightened perspective on everyday experiences to help anyone willing realize their true potential and inspire a contemporary spiritual life lift in service to all. Say goodbye to the man-made paradigms of distorted ideas. Let's become pure, free, and actually intelligent once again. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Mirror Talks with Bentinho Massaro. This episode, Why True Spirituality is Science, is about how genuine spirituality, not spiritual concepts and dogma and lifestyle, but genuine self-knowledge is the evolution of science. And I suppose it's not just the evolution of science, but it's also the missing foundation, which renders most scientific pursuits unscientific by their own definition. So indeed, this episode is the potential to trigger many self-proclaimed scientifically oriented people because it exposes a major oversight, an inconvenient oversight that most folks simply aren't willing to examine. But for those who do have the willingness to examine it, this will be a fun episode. So you can expect this one to start slow and steady as Bentinho lays some groundwork for a punchline that happens right around the halfway mark. Then in the second half, a lot of the pieces start coming together as we paint the picture of a more enlightened scientific approach. My favorite part is toward the end when Bentinho talks about faith, something typically shunned by the scientific community, and how faith in the truth drives a passion for knowing reality, while dogma, religious or so-called scientific, drives a perpetuation of the concepts we're comfy and familiar with. So I'm excited to share this one with you guys. Enjoy. So, I mean, I think from a, just a fundamental entry level perspective, um, a lot of people would wonder what spirituality even is. So do you have an answer for that? If somebody just asks you what even is spirituality? I'd say it's the science of life. The term spiritual obviously has been used in so many different contexts. Um, and yeah, I don't, I don't resonate too much with the term necessarily, but also don't have a strong resistance to it. Um, so if people ask me, what do you do? Typically, I just say I'm a spiritual teacher, because it kind of kind of gets the message across. But spirituality, in a sense, it wouldn't exist, if we were not so ignorant, if we were not so veiled, and so physically focused and so materialistic in our understanding of life. Because really, spirituality is just life itself. It is, I mean, as a science or as a path, the spiritual path is the path of knowing life itself, getting to know life itself. So, and, and that's what science is all about, is getting to know life, getting to understand life. So really, mm. ultimately, spirituality is a, is a science. It's a form of science. Um, you could even say it is science. Spirituality is science because it aims to understand life. So spirituality and life are synonymous in a way. Life itself, existence is, you could say spiritual or spirituality is existence or the study of existence, the understanding of existence. So, but again, because we've separated our reality so much into, into this material compartment, um, we've created a separate branch, and we call it religion, or we call it spirituality. But really, if you think about it, if we didn't have the misunderstanding to begin with, or if we weren't so veiled from understanding life and, and approaching life in a holistic way, like uh, the understanding of existence itself in a holistic way, then we wouldn't have needed to create this sort of mm. thing called spirituality. And sometimes people see it kind of like a hobby or like a um, just an interest that you uh, insert into your Facebook interests or whatever. <laughs> but, and I understand, like, if you, if you need to become familiar with it for the first time, it makes sense to call it something. 
So spirituality is, in a sense, if we want to separate it a little bit from life as most people know it, like the more material life, you could say there's materialism and there's spirituality or spiritualism, I suppose you could say. So where materialism is all about the belief system of physicality is first and foremost, and that is the reality. Spirituality would be about either the belief or understanding or knowing or assumption that there is a spiritual quality to existence or a spiritual reality to existence that is either in addition to the materialistic reality or the physical reality. And therefore, sometimes we call it metaphysical or beyond physical mm -hmm. or extra physical. Or so that's, that's one way of seeing spirituality is the understanding that in addition to physical reality, and manifest reality, there is a metaphysical or spiritual domain or reality. And so that's one way of seeing it. The other way is, you could say some people that are into spirituality see it almost entirely the other way around from the materialistic point of view, such as actually, there only is a spiritual reality. And what appears to be materialistic is actually an illusion that's made of spirit, whatever that spirit then is defined to be in that particular person's vocabulary. But so we got materialism, then we got spirituality as sort of a back and forth between materialism and spirituality, where it's kind of like a hobby, maybe or something you could be interested in, like the question, are you spiritual? It's kind of funny to me. Mm -hmm. you know? It's like, do, mm -hmm. do you exist? Mm -hmm. um, or there is spirituality where people really take it all the way in the other direction, where instead of materialistic, they are, you could say it's just terms, but they're spiritual in nature, to the degree where they really understand or view or believe life to be essentially entirely spiritual in nature. And again, however they define that is, of course, you'll get 7 billion different answers. But just to get the general gist across, that there is a reality to spirit, or whatever that spirit is, consciousness or something invisible, a power and intelligence. Um, and some people like start out materialistic, and then they kind of transfer to gaining an interest in spirituality, because being materialistic in their focus, or, or just looking at physical reality through the senses and the thinking mind doesn't satisfy them. It doesn't give them a sense of home, it doesn't give them a sense of mm -hmm. belonging, a sense of uh, who they are, a sense of clarity as to why they're here and so forth. So then they typically begin to become more spiritually oriented. Um, but really, it's just being oriented towards life in a way that goes beyond just the common materialistic Newtonian, physical type of point of view. So as we begin to expand, because being physically focused, or being materialistically oriented, or believing heavily in materialism, uh, not the materialism where it's about getting stuff, right, but materialism, like, things are matter based, and reality is the reality of matter, what we see through the senses is really there. And it's real. And that's the reality. And everything else is just thought and imagination and fantasy. But that doesn't satisfy a lot of people. But that is a way of understanding life. It is a way to be materialistic to be um, classically sort of scientific mm -hmm. or uh, Newtonian in your understanding, it's a way of understanding life. So it is a form of spirituality. But since that doesn't ultimately satisfy the soul, let's assume there is such a thing, then people start to expand their science of life or their desire to understand life into a broader domain or, or they widen the spectrum. Now for the pure materialist, skeptic, scientist, atheist, not that all scientists are atheists and all atheists are scientists and so forth, but just to get the picture across very generally, no offense to any of these demographics, but sort of the, the atheistic, skeptical, scientifically Newtonian based person will then view 
the person that begins to sort of expand their window of their aperture, if you will, of letting more of the light in, letting more of the spectrum of life in and opening themselves up to different faculties of knowing such as intuition, direct perception beyond the senses and the thinking mind. Um, uh, maybe they use hallucinogenetics or whatever it is, whatever pathway they choose, yoga, breath control, meditation, visualization, and so forth. While a lot of the materialistic people or people that are focused exclusively on the material end of the spectrum or paradigm of the spectrum that bent with, uh, may understand that some of these methods can be helpful, but they, it doesn't really shift their paradigm. Let's say the methodology of visualizing your goals or stuff like that. To the spiritually oriented mind, there is a spiritual reality behind that practice, typically speaking. But for the materially focused entity, there it's really just fantasy, but it helps. It helps means the focus. To an end. It's a means to an end, and it helps to be more productive physically, right? And oftentimes people want to kind of reduce it, want to reduce spirituality to okay, well, what? How does it benefit me in my reality, mm -hmm. in the reality, which is for most people physical reality? So for the most part, they will view, you know, some of their friends will be into spirituality, and maybe they'll have fun dialogues, but sometimes on the more extreme ends, they'll just think of that as diluted, they may respect it, or not respect it, but they'll see it as diluted, or as just like sort of a fantasy, or they'll say like, well, if it works for them, great. But there's mm -hmm. not really an appreciation of the believer understanding in the more spiritually oriented entity. There's not really a curiosity as to like, maybe there is some truth to that, maybe there is some credibility, maybe there is some reality to that. So then on the other far end of the spectrum, you have people that really devote themselves to the science of life. And this is really where spirituality becomes more than a hobby, more than a Facebook interest, more than something you do once a week at your yoga class and talk with your friends about every once in a while. It becomes more than just philosophy. It becomes really a way of life. It really becomes the study of life itself through the means of direct experience. So really spirituality is an extension of science, it's an evolution in science, it's not different. If we define science as the attempt to understand life, right, to frame it, to understand it, to grok it, to know it, life, or you could say existence or creation, some people say the universe. But this this weird principle that we have here, of experience of, of existing, the experience that we have that we all have, the experience of I exist, I am and you also seem to be you also seem to have a sense of existence to you. We're trying to understand that but the the scientist who's not including the spiritual bandwidth of the spectrum of life will be limited to study of what we call the empirical world which is observed, it's not that empirical, because it's observed through the senses only, and the thinking mind, uh, for the most part, like even the instruments we use to measure physical reality, or as the materialist believes it to be the reality, like reality is only this, which we can see. When we're limited to the materialistic view, and we're not truly open, and there's no such thing as healthy skepticism in this, so much like mm -hmm. you really have to have an openness because the spiritual reality the bent with that we would call spiritual but we don't again we only call it spiritual because we've been so focused on matter so more accurate would be a different portion of the spectrum of life of existence itself if you want to open up to that you got you got to open up to different faculties of knowing different ways different means of knowing things you cannot just rely on the intellect, the reasoning mind, the logical mind, and the sense perceptions. Once you understand, and most scientists would agree with that, with this, I mean, it's been proven, that we only perceive so much of the spectrum of light and sound mm -hmm. and so forth. So we only perceive a very tiny perception, even of what we could say is physical, the physical reality. And so to study life, so some of the materialistically oriented people or scientists or 
they know about that knowledge. If you say that, it's not a new quote, necessarily. What I just said about we can only perceive a small percentage of the spectrum of light and sound, and our senses can only perceive a tiny, tiny portion of what's out there, so to speak. Even though people know that, they don't apply it, typically. They don't mm -hmm. incorporate that, and it doesn't baffle them or struck them with awe or humble them to their knees in a good way to where they begin to open up to different ways of knowing. So what distinguishes the spiritual adept from the materialistic adept, both are scientists of life, is that the spiritual adept is open to utilize different means of knowing. And of course, it is a bit of a fine line, because what is fantasy? And what is experience? Or what is what is a scientific approach to spirituality? Because a lot of people do just think all kinds of things and then give that right. meaning and reality. And then it kind of falls off the bandwagon. And then we as a spiritual community just appear kind of nuts. Even like all major religions, there's all kinds of weird dogma. And sure. Yeah, things that are not proven, uh, probably never will be provable. Right. And but also the way that people use it and the way that their ego latches onto these concepts and right. dr dramatizes them and fantasizes about them and so forth, and then proclaims it the truth and all that. It is a fine line to not sort of um, lose your groundedness and lose this ability to be objective and reasonable. But again, spirituality, if we wish to, if we wish to understand life, we must open up to different ways of knowing life. And so spirituality really is the same as science, but it's an extension of it. It's an evolution of it. It, it addresses other bandwidths of the spectrum as well, other frequencies within the bandwidth of existence as well. And so the spiritual adept, assuming that they're grounded, like I was just explaining, assuming that they're sincere and earnest, and they wish to arrive at a balanced view and understanding of life or existence, they have an edge, in my opinion, over the materialistic paradigm locked into scientist or materialistic adept, because they are limited to the intellect, for the most part, the intellect mm -hmm. and the senses, and to some degree, intuition. Some scientists are great at incorporating their intuition and following their hunches and then coming to great discoveries. So there's definitely, a, you know, there's not just one type of Newtonian scientist. There's, there's an infinite range, an infinite spectrum of how open people are. But to exemplify my point, if you have a more extremely materialistically based adept versus a more spiritually oriented adept, the spiritually oriented adept has opened up, has accepted, has faith in other ways of knowing. So basically, in my view, spirituality is science. The art of spirituality is the same as the art of science. I agree, not many people approach it in that way, approach it in a scientific way. But it really just is the understanding of life. You do take an extremely scientific approach to your spirituality, though, or to your seeking, compared to most spiritual people, your approaches, you, you really do value the principles of science, it seems. like being honest about what you find and not embellishing and not sort of creating mm -hmm. fantasy stuff, but really. Yeah, I will not claim that I've never done that, but I have done my best to keep it as, uh, to make sure that the spiritual approach follows what I call the scientific attitude or the scientific approach. So if we define a scientific approach as and I'm sure a lot of scientists would come up with a different definition. So I won't grab everybody with this one, but something along the lines of to study to observe as objectively as one can, mm -hmm. with as little personal bias involved, right? We when we're when someone even in the materialistic domain, if someone is highly unscientific, then they're just their bias is all over the place. Right? And a true scientist, or someone who follows the more true scientific approach, um, 
will kind of uh, either laugh at that or just not take it seriously. Because it's just obvious that a lot of times, people's biases are very heavily involved. So the scientific approach is the study of life, the study of understanding life, or certain of certain components of life, with an attitude that is as objective and bias free as possible, testable, uh, repeatable, and so forth. So let's address a little bit more what spirituality in my view. So I've already addressed that I would I would like people to understand it as a science. I, I have done my best to distill it in as scientific a way as is possible. And again, when I say that we got to understand that what the materialistically oriented scientist will call unscientific, I might still call scientific, if it follows what I call the scientific approach. But if someone is so closed off to other means of knowledge, other than physical instruments, the sense organs and the reasoning intellect, if they're closed off to any other means to knowing, then anything that I say, that's not proven with a physical instrument, will be called by some mm -hmm. as unscientific, as delusional as fantasy as whatever imagined imaginary. So, so let's clarify also this scientific approach. So I believe that the true sage, if you will, someone who's gone really deep in the science of life, by including the bandwidths that are not physical, that don't follow the laws of matter, they've included incorporated different faculties of knowledge, different ways of different means of knowing things. Then, and they've done that in a balanced way, and they've done it intensely, like every day, like nonstop. They, in my, in my eyes, they are the true scientists. And I'll clarify why in a little bit. Because, because they're following the scientific approach, essentially, even though it's not physical, Phys limited to physical science, so it's not limited to physical instruments. But again, if the scientific approach is defined as examining life, the study of life in an uh, as unbiased way as possible, then that means we have to look at our own biases to begin with, if we wish to, because we are the instrument of knowledge, like no matter what physical instruments or extensions, uh, of means of knowing we utilize as scientists, we are the we are that meeting point of all the data of all our sense organs of all our reasoning. So I may have all kinds of physical devices here that measure all kinds of things and frequencies and cause and effect and gravity and what have you, uh, or the effect of gravity. So let's say I have this whole table here filled with physical equipment that's been scientifically used for the last 50 or 100 years. And it's a uh, it's respected as being a scientific way, a scientific approach of knowing life. I say yes, that is a scientific way of approaching life, but it's a very limited way of applying the scientific approach. Because again, in my eyes, the true scientist is one who not only uses these things, according to what science accepts, or what current paradigm science accepts, but they also aim to become a better scientist because we are the instrument. If I have all these tools here, it's still I am the instrument through which I know these things, that there's no way around it, that an instrument cannot know anything without me knowing it. So I have to, if I want to be unbiased, and therefore scientific, I have to investigate my biases. And a lot of accepted scientists don't investigate their biases that True. well, some do, but a lot also don't. And they may do it with certain paradigms, especially the ones they ridicule or don't believe in or wish to disprove. Um, and sometimes mm -hmm. also with the ones they are trying to prove, but typically the ones we're trying to, we want to prove, we're not looking at the biases. Um, and also the ones that we're trying to disprove, we're not really looking at the biases, because at the very root of our own instrument, there is a bias towards this or that being true. Mm -hmm. So we already have a preference, we're already setting out to prove or disprove something. It's very rare to find a scientist that actually, in my experience, anyway, maybe, you know, I don't spend lots of time in scientific communities per se, but, but sort of the common mainstream 
quasi understanding of science or the scientific approach, I find people don't examine their biases that well. And if we wish to be, if we wish to perform the greatest art of science, we must improve the instrument, the scientist, just like if you want to become a great soccer player, you have to improve the instrument. You can love soccer as much as you want and watch it at TV and know everything about it. But if you don't work on the instrument, you're not going to be a better performer of soccer. And I just find, I just find there is quite a bit of pride in the materialistically oriented scientific community, priding themselves in being scientific, as opposed to anyone who kind of crosses the boundary from physical mm -hmm. to metaphysical, or from intellectual to intuitive, or from sense organs to um, metaphysical ways of experiencing things. And it's kind of frowned upon. And often there's some sense of pride in being more scientific, being more realistic. Mm -hmm. But, but you have to question that because if the scientific approach involves the main instrument of all knowledge, which is us, because their knowledge is inert without us, like we are the ones that know it, we are the ones that define it, we are the ones that understand it. So I'm the scientist and all the science that I perform, just like the soccer player or the artist or the painter, everything that I perform is going to have its meeting place in me as the performer, as the scientist in this case. So if I claim if I take pride in being scientific in my approach, but I forget, or refuse, or just don't understand that I'm not actually addressing my own biases and my own paradigm, then that makes me unscientific. So mm -hmm. I can laugh or ridicule other people that claim to be scientific, all I want, but I'm actually not following the scientific approach. If I in, in fact, if I ridicule anything that I don't understand, or can't prove or disprove, but just because it's not accepted, if I mm -hmm. ridicule it and feel any kind of pride, I've become a flawed scientist. So the true scientists aim is more, in my opinion, is more on improving the vehicle, the instrument, the, the scientist itself, then it's actually focused on whatever science it's working at. Just like the soccer player w spends way more time improving their vehicle than they do actually playing in the Champions League or in whatever game, you know, whatever tournament's going on. So the, the field time, that's prime time, it's broadcasted on TV, and that's, that's what we keep score of, is only, you know, 5% if that of the training that is involved and the, and the mental work and the attitude and the getting up every day and the dieting and the going to the training field and working out and r going for a run. So the soccer player or this any sportsman spends way more time off the field than on the field. I mean, the training might be on the field, but you get the point mm -hmm. behind the scenes rather than in front of the scenes, right? So the true scientists and they do exist, for sure. But I'm just kind of addressing the general pride that does exist in materialistically oriented scientists that considers everything else to be non science, but fails to investigate the instrument of their own scientific approach, and therefore actually becomes unscientific per definition, but they don't realize it because of the pride. So the true scientist, in my point of view, spends way more time optimizing the instrument through which all the knowledge will be gained. All along sort of contextual story, to get to the point that the true spiritual aspirant is the truest scientist of them all, in my view, because they take science all the way. And this is really where we get to the heart of what is spirituality. Now, roughly, there's two categories to spirituality, I have found one deals with self actualization. Spirituality always has to do with the nature of life and the nature of who am I and so forth. But there's this branch of empowerment and self actualization and self expression, and kind of dealing with the thoughts and the emotions and optimizing our mindset and becoming a better person, if you will, and becoming a more aligned person and having a better sense of what our calling or our purpose is and executing that with greater ease and greater abundance and greater efficiency. So we work on ourselves as individuals, important aspect of life. So this is the category of empowerment, mm -hmm. or self actualization, it's the actualizing of oneself, 
there's so much latent tendencies within us that need to be explored and discovered, and choices that need to be made and, and alignments that need to happen, kind of like your car in the garage realignments and stuff, in order to be a more aligned, you could say, in a sense, better performing also individual in life. So that's the whole category of spirituality that I would call self actualization. Then there's this seemingly separate branch, which has to do actually with transcending the individual, or not identifying with the individual. And this has typically been termed enlightenment or self realization, self with the capital S, like the realization of the true self. And what is the true self? And very quickly, we find that it's not the thoughts, it's not the emotions, it's not the physical body, and it's not our actions, and it's not even our choices. So quite rapidly in the path of self realization, if, if you're following those types of teachings and scriptures and teachers, the path of enlightenment suggests that there is sort of a singular reality behind that, all these phenomenal appearances and experiences. That is the true self. And the aim of enlightenment is to realize that true self directly in our direct experience. So you kind of have these two branches. And their approaches are different, their meditations are different, their contemplations are different, their teachings are very different. And um, I'll, I'll kind of get back to how they, how they uh, are ultimately one or how they come together. Mm -hmm. But first, I want to finish my point, I think about so what is spirituality? And how is this scientific? How is spirituality actually the art of the true scientist, if done in a grounded way? And here is one main important distinction that I think, in my eyes, safely debunks a lot of the scientific arrogance that exists in the materialistically focused scientist or scientific community. And I hope to just create a little bit more respect for the spiritually oriented scientists. Um, so having now kind of defined my understanding or definition of what it means to be a scientist, which is, first of all, wanting to be as unbiased in your own ways of knowing as you possibly can. All knowledge is secondary to the knower having purified its instrument. I like that. Right? Because again, we are our, our only means of knowing is ultimately us as a knowing consciousness, but then we have these different sub instruments to this core instrument of consciousness itself, which such as the body, the senses, the intellect, um, language, and what have you, intuition, meditation. So, but we again, we are the instrument, we are the scientists, we are the scientific instrument, all other instruments depend on us and all knowledge that we that we um, deduce from our other external instruments, they filter through our instrument. So if our instrument is filtered, if it's biased, if it has a belief system that's rigid, if it's stuck in a paradigm, if it's afraid to be ridiculed, that's a bias, that's not objective. Mm -hmm. As soon as you have a single fear of being ridiculed, you're already unfit as a scientist, or at least representing true scientists. And show me a materialistically oriented scientist that is not afraid to be ridiculed by its peers. So there's very little, very few true scientists left, wow. by my definition, anyway. So again, it's the optimization, it's the purification of the instrument of all knowledge, which is ourselves, and no scientist can deny this, that all knowledge, all data, all other instruments are filtered through their instrumentation, because that's the only means to knowing. We can't know directly from a camera or from a device or a measurement device. We, we first have to see it, we have to filter it, we have to deduce it, we have to reason with it, and so forth. So then if we take this to the ultimate level, we arrive at true spirituality in its essence. That's why I say spirituality is science, true science, and a true spiritual adept, the sage, the one who takes this all the way, is the truest scientist of them all, so to speak. And here is the main distinction between those who call themselves scientists, but are not actually following the scientific approach, in my definition. And those who are true scientists, but are not often recognized that way, because the majority of people are more rooted in the more biased reality of the materialistic 
scientific view. Therefore, therefore, there's this gap. But both are scientists, both can apply the scientific approach. And so the scientific approach, at its core, what needs to be understood is that the main bias, as I see it, in those that stay within the physically proven materialistic Newtonian kind of realm of things, physical mat the matter is reality, uh, cause and effect and so forth. Those that stick and adhere to that and get a lot of respect from the rest of the world, because most people limit themselves to that. Therefore, it's a mutually reinforcing kind of mm -hmm. like a gossip group where everyone shares their insecurities, and we reinforce each other's insecurities. And then we we paint a picture of a bad guy, because it reinforces our egos, right? So quite a bit of the scientific or those who think they're scientific, um, even when they're not really practicing it, are kind of in that domain of like not really expanding their vision. So the main thing that I would like to get across, that I think would resolve this to a large extent, the difference between these two camps is of the materialistic scientist and the spiritual scientist is the understanding the inclusion of consciousness itself. Now, there are many scientists that are that are asking questions about what is consciousness, and they're trying to come up with viable answers and viable solutions and so forth. But to this day, it's remained a mystery to the materialistic uh, scientist, while to the best examples of the spiritual scientists of our times, it has been resolved. That's why, ultimately, they are true scientists, and they're more advanced scientists, because they don't necessarily deny that within a certain realm of perception, if you uh, drop a glass, it will fall to the ground and break cause and effect. And there is gravity and there's this and there's that. They won't deny that they can also see that they include that, but they have resolved the mystery of consciousness. Consciousness, I think, is the stumbling block. It's the bridge between the materialistic scientist and the spiritual scientist to if that can be bridged, if that can be incorporated and understood and appreciated in the proper light and with the proper respect by the materialistic scientific community then mm. it's really becomes apparent that science is an approach. It's not a paradigm of findings. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah. cool. So s typically, when we think of when we kind of just automatically talk about science, what mm -hmm. do you think about astronomers, uh, physicists, uh, people that observe how different liquids separate and, and reunite and what have you. So you're thinking of things that are physically proven with physical instruments, empirically evident materialist, you think about materialists, basically. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking about data and findings. But that's not science. If you go to the heart of science, it's an approach, it's an attitude. Mm -hmm. It's an ongoing evolving attitude, it's an approach, true science is an approach, it's not a particular paradigm of data. It's not even proven or unproven stuff. Science is an attitude. It's an way of life. And consciousness is the fundamental bridge and at present still separator between these two camps. And in, in the following way, this applies, I'm generalizing, so there are exceptions. But the typical materialistically oriented, peer opinion reinforced, respectable physicists, scientists, and so forth, in general, they may ask questions about the nature of consciousness, where how does it arise? What causes it? Is it does it come before matter? Does it come after matter? Is it a result of matter? Is matter the result of consciousness? The more philosophically inclined scientists may start to ask these questions. So a very great start. But you don't often see people that claim to be scientific in their approach, actually take the scientific approach to the bias they have about reality being real in a materialistic way. Cool. Again, in the following way. 
if we know that's the scientific approach, I feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but I want to make this clear. Mm -hmm. So if the scientific approach is to be as unbiased in our investigation and purify the instrument of data finding and so forth, the one that comes to conclusion, the one that observes even before it comes to conclusions, right? Because often we observe what we've concluded, but we don't even mm -hmm. know we're concluding things. Again, bias, belief systems, and so forth. They all think this, and quantum science has shown that whatever you believe and expect has an effect on matter, which is one example that a lot of classical Newtonian scientists or materialistically oriented scientists just kind of completely either forget about conveniently. This is a major finding. It's like huge. massive. Mass, hello. The observer affects the phenomenon. What? We should completely rewrite science. Mm -hmm. But we don't. Because it's not comfortable. And then we're no longer experts in our field. And then we're dummies again. We have to start from scratch. That's why a lot of people are not true scientists, because their intention is not true knowledge. It is to be respectable, to just mm -hmm. kind of follow their passion in a certain way. Um, Again, not all of them. Some are really genuine, genuine seekers of truth. Again, really. But there's this sort of broad, sort of lesser intelligent, very vast community of scientists that it's all about pride for the most part. And, and, and of course, there's a dose of passion in that because we all have a passion for life and astronomy and so forth. But, but it's so tainted by pride and, and, and stigma and, and taboo and sticking to that paradigm. So when you hear something like that, and that's not even the most profound thing. That's just one of the effects is that consciousness affects matter. Like this should, if you're a true scientist, this should stop you in your tracks. This should make you reinvestigate every finding you've ever found. Mm -hmm. Do people do that? No, hell no. People don't do that. Scientists don't do that. They just don't do that. Again, very rare exception who does. So first of all, that eliminates 99% of people as scientists that claim to be scientists. Because you're not a scientist based on the data you find, you're a scientist based on your approach. It's an attitude. Mm. It's got to mm -hmm. be pure. It's got to be super earnest. It's got to be about purifying the instrument, the scientist itself. But we don't. Maybe we hear these things and it's like, oh, that's cool. Fine. Well, that's weird. Well, I don't know how that works. Let me go back to this. And, and again, the pride continues. Humility is hard to find especially in respectable communities, very hard to find humility, because it takes great courage, it takes great sacrifice of ego, which requires spiritual understanding of life. <laughs> so if you don't have that, you're kind of screwed, you're locked into this Newtonian way of thinking. Um, and uh, a lot of it is run by ego, whether consciously or unconsciously. That's not even the biggest thing, the whole quantum science thing, where the observer affects the outcome of, an, of a result and such. The bigger thing is, again, consciousness itself, like this is the mm -hmm. bridge. And the main here, the, what separates the materialist from the spiritualist is, again, very roughly generalizing the materialist, and again, there's a whole spectrum in between, but the materialist end of the spectrum believes religiously, science is religion, religiously believes, doesn't know, believes, doesn't know, it's never proven, believes religious, religiously believes that matter equals existence or reality. And that, that is all there is to reality for the most part. And believes that consciousness is somehow an effect produced by this matter. Mm -hmm. And typically also, not always, but if we really go to sort of the lowest vibrational spectrum, or the like the most narrow bandwidth type of Newtonian materialistic scientific view, it's at which point it's no longer really scientific, but it's a view a religion. It's the most limiting religion. There also is no, there's no understanding, belief or openness for there being an intelligence to the causing of matter. So somehow, the trillions of planets that are in perfect orbit around the sun and the lifespan of things, the rhythm of this cosmos, the way that life grows, pops out of the ground virtually everywhere. 
So we have this belief that consciousness is the result of matter. It's the materialistic end of the spectrum. The spiritual end of the spectrum is consciousness or spirit is actually prior to or more fundamental than the manifestation of matter, that somehow there's a spiritual reality of sorts. And you can visualize this however you want, and everyone does it differently. But somehow there is an intelligence, there is a power, a powerful intelligence, a consciousness, if you will, a sentience, an aliveness, an intelligence that somehow is responsible for the organization of all kinds of realities, including the very tail end of the spectrum, physical sense perception based matter, light, sounds and so forth. Now, we again, in my definition, we cannot call ourselves a true scientist. If we do not investigate the following direct experience. It's at the root of all our findings. No? Mm -hmm. I, again, I can use instruments within instruments within instruments that observe things without my knowledge, and I come back to the data. And But ultimately, all knowledge is based on dependent on experiencing, direct experiencing. So again, the scientist, the true scientist needs to investigate what is this, because this is my instrument for knowing. What is this instrument for knowing? We call it by a name, and it's consciousness. The word is not the thing, but it's just the word that points to it. Okay, there is this phenomena, this phenomenon of consciousness, awareness, sentience, the ability to know, the ability to recognize things. That's at the root of all our findings. We cannot deny this. I know, therefore, I know anything else. But it's not, I don't know, one plus one equals two. No, it's I know, then it's one plus one equals two. So regardless of the finding, at the root of every finding, scientific or unscientific, is the experiencer, it's the consciousness. It's the, it's, the, it's the main instrument, the, inst the one instrument to rule them all. <laughs> so we need to investigate what is this consciousness, but a lot of self proclaimed scientists just don't really investigate that. And when they do, it's only sort of hypothetical, mm -hmm. and not by direct experience. That's again, why I say the sages are the true scientists, the truest scientists. Now, people make beautiful efforts, so I don't want to dismiss those efforts. But if we have to place it in a hierarchy, the sage, which is not a word for someone who's gone really profoundly into the direct experience of their true selves, of consciousness itself, explored the nature of consciousness itself, and then emerges enlightened, if you will, is the truest scientist because they've really gone as deep as one can go in purifying the instrument, investigating the instrument itself. Therefore, their resulting views will seem very different. Their, their findings will be different from those that limit themselves to a bandwidth of assumption, bias, intellectual reasoning, logic, uh, calculations, mathematics, sense perceptions. And that's pretty much it with a little dose of intuition here and there, depending on who it is following their hunches kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But direct experience itself typically is negated or bypassed. But direct experience is consciousness, consciousness is direct experience. So what would bridge this? What would expand the materialistic view to include the spiritual view, and therefore we could just call it life or the science of life as one whole spectrum, including observing the loss of physical reality, but not limiting that by calling physical reality, the reality or existence, the world, what we call the world, we often think of as existence or creation. But that's just a very small subset It's a very small bandwidth of frequencies that we're able to perceive and, and uh, reason with. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand there's a difference between existence and the world. The world is just what we're allowed to see through our tiny little binoculars pointed at this tiny little spectrum of light. But often in the in 
our hubris, in our ignorance, innocently so for the most part, we assume that by studying the world, we're studying a life mm -hmm. or existence. And that our findings about the world equals findings about life. And this is the farthest from the truth in my experience. Again, a whole world would open up if the materialistically oriented scientists would understand that in their feverish passion to prove and disprove and have these findings about the world, somehow symbolize an understanding of life, make that false association of existence. They have to, at some point, if they wish to expand their understanding of life, go beyond the world. They have to see that all this time, they have been biased in the way of assuming they've, they've every finding they found about the world is based on a not investigated assumption. Therefore, it's completely unscientific in its approach, or largely unscientific. And that is the bias or belief or assumption, again, it's an assumption, true science is not based on assumption, right? It goes against mm -hmm. the definition of science. It's to not assume, it's mm -hmm. to prove, it's to know directly, to know as objectively and as unbiased as we can. So if I, if my whole world of worldly science is based on, a, it is the result of me assuming one major thing, and that assumption is never investigated. Now, naturally, all my findings within that paradigm can only be said to belong to that belief system. And the assumption is that there is a physical reality. It's never been proven that there is, I should be more specific, that there is a physical reality that exists, that is real, independent from the knower, or the instrument of knowing or the scientist itself. No science can exist apart from the scientist. That's why it's so crucial that the scientist purifies its own instrument, its own self. This is why spirituality is the evolution of science. Because it's the most unbiased attempt at knowing life, at knowing self at knowing this mystery of existence. If I assume that the world I perceive with my senses exists independent from me experiencing it, that's a major assumption. It's never been proven. It cannot be proven. But all of science, all of respectable science, all the respectable scientific magazines, and again, beautiful stuff in there, but I'm just kind of creating a caricature, so it's more obvious, of the hubris that does exist for, for the most part in those that sort of think of themselves as analytical, scientific, realistic people. There is just a lot of mm -hmm. hubris in that community. Again, not all, but a lot. So, but to, to understand that everything in these articles, for the most part, is completely based on an uninvestigated assumption, uninvestigated assumption, an uninvestigated assumption, a bias, a belief, it's religion. Every, almost everything in those magazines is religious by definition. You see, if science means to be unbiased and to not investigate from assumption, as much as possible. And yet the attitude is completely unscientific towards the assumption that there is a reality that exists physically independent from consciousness, which has never been proven. You've never had an experience apart from your experience. You've never experienced any data or scientific magazine apart from experiencing it. So the true scientist investigates the experiencer and the nature of experiencing. But based on the assumption that's not investigated, why is it not investigated? Because it requires a shit ton of effort and right. self deconstruction. The ego does not like it. Mm -hmm. And whatever the ego does not like, it will shove under the rug, it will overanalyze in different ways, it will cover up. Always trying to cover its tracks, its, its fallacies, its biases. Mm -hmm. 
And people have their science jobs and they're getting paid and they have to keep working and producing their daily quota of scientific work. Right. And there'd be, you know, they get some sense of respect and gratification. And if you're satisfied, you won't look deeper. If you're satisfied with what you have and what you get out of it, then already by definition, you're unfit to be a true scientist, just like the person who only eats fries and Budweiser, drinks Budweiser and watches uh, <laughs> movies, five movies a day, is unfit to play in the NFL. <laughs> They're unfit, but we've got so many unfit <laughs> scientists writing for scientific communities and, and articles. And anyway, I just think it's a, it's a limitation. It's a bit of shame. But I think if scientists took that on, I mean, there would definitely be a fear in the community at large that if all our scientists had to go on some sort of inward journey and like investigate the root of this, we'd lose medicine. We'd lose, I don't know, political science. We'd lose everybody who's thinking scientifically because it's hard work. I mean, it really is, it rips the entire rug out from underneath our scientific. Mm -hmm. But why couldn't it just evolve? We could continue to dispense medicine as it is while we evolve. And we can continue to write these articles while we start to incorporate more of the assumption that there even is a reality apart from consciousness. And again, the quantum model has already, to a great degree, hinted at by demonstrating the effects that this should be questioned, that there being an independent reality to what I believe I'm experiencing through my senses out there, that it actually exists separate from consciousness. Major assumption, therefore we're being unscientific, but yes, it would deconstruct our entire conceptual worldview. It's just a worldview that would be deconstructed. It's not reality. It's not existence. It's not life that would disappear in us. It's just the world that would disappear. As it stands, our understanding of the world would collapse. And of course, we don't like that because we get our paycheck and our neighbors uh, appreciate the work that we do and what have you. So that's fine. But the true scientist is also the most courageous individual. Cool. And mm -hmm. I don't consider many people true scientists. And I think this could evolve. There could be more scientists. And then, then the findings we could have about the phenomenal, call it illusion, call it reality, whatever you will, would be so exciting. Like we would find so many exciting possibilities if only we started to investigate the instrument of all knowledge, which is the knower, mm. consciousness. So if you take this all the way, you start to be able to directly experience consciousness without the need for contents, without the need for thoughts, without the need for emotions, without the need for bias, without the need for beliefs, just the direct experience of pure experiencing. And this has a transformative effect upon the assumption of self, the assumption of what we believe we are. It has a greatly purifying effect, astonishing purifying effect on the instrument, which is the scientist itself. And inevitably, it will affect its findings because the bias starts to disappear and the wonder starts to open up and different faculties of knowing start to become available and accessible because we're not shut off from that because we're so fixated on our religious paradigm that we call science. And the problem, again, why I addressed the pride is because the pride is what keeps us locked into it because mm. that's the gratification, that's the reward. We, we call religious people religious nuts or, or, not always, again, I, you know, we respect religion to a great degree, and most people are religious, but there is this sort of intellectual trend of seeing religion right. or spirituality as inferior to materialistic, empirical, evidence-based Newtonian thinking. And the pride of that makes, makes those people blind from seeing the assumptions that they live in, and therefore that actually, per definition, their approach is more religious than scientific. And this is exactly what enlightenment is all about. This is why enlightenment is science. Not a science, it is science. It's the science. It is the investigation of reality, not just the world of the senses. Reality. And reality can only be known if we go to the very root that we know for sure is true. And that is I exist.
or different way of saying it, I know. Somehow, I know, and you could add, I know that I am. That you can never take away from anybody. The power of being or knowing. It's the root that it has to be there along with any other finding or study we do. You cannot do a study without being there, without, without existing, without being conscious, without having the power to know. The power to know is the very essence of all knowledge. A true scientist would naturally feel inclined and curious and courageous in their investigation for the truth. The scientists are trying to get to the truth. Therefore, you have to look at your assumptions, because they're assumptions, they might not be true. And it's not necessarily true that reality as the world of the senses, what the senses perceive exists apart from experiencing, because we've never experienced that, we can't prove that. So it's a major assumption. But all science is based on this assumption. Most of all science is based on this assumption to a large extent. So then in the path of enlightenment, we turn the only truth that we know is not an assumption. Or at least it's the least assumed thing, which mm -hmm. is, I am able to know just that. And we turn that power back onto itself. Now, life, sentience, consciousness, existence is getting to know itself. Science, right? Life getting to know itself is another word for science. Hmm. So then why don't we do that? Why do we only investigate things within a paradigm of assumptions, and not investigate life itself? And here's the problem with the pride and the attachment to instruments, physical instruments and data and proving things in a Newtonian way. The problem with that is that we've become mistrusting of direct experience, when in fact, it's all we ever have. It's literally all we ever have. All our findings are based in consciousness. Their foundation, their basis is the ability to know, to be and to know. So why don't we investigate the power to know? And we can because the power to know can know itself. But this requires a completely different 180 degree different view, instead of looking outward through the senses and the thinking mind, we have to look before the senses and the thinking mind, we have to turn our attention back prior to the appearance of bias and thought and assumption and senses. And we have to rest. And this takes time, this takes practice, it takes maturation. Just like anything that we study, we need to be concentrated on. If life wants to know itself, if you want to know yourself, then you need to marinate in, you need to stay attentive, aware of that power of awareness itself. And those are just words, but go find that sense of I exist. And I know this or that. But instead of focusing on this or that, which immediately brings in the mind and the senses and all kinds of assumptions, try to just register the fact that that you know, this or that, but instead of focusing on this and that you focus on the element of I know. Again, this or that may appear this thought that thought this belief that belief this assumption that assumption this physical finding that physical finding this sensation that sensation, but go back to I know, become investigative, like a biologist who just can stare at a flower for three hours straight, or uh, an insect uh, colony as they're communicating with each other somehow. And they're just fascinated and the whole world disappears. And all that's there is their concentration, their involvement with that species of insect or whatever it is. That, you know, when you were just a kid, and you're like laying around the dirt, and you saw this bee, and you were mm -hmm. just absorbed, just and you were in pure samadhi, like unity consciousness, <laughs> with what you were observing. 
in the world of time and space, and assumptions disappeared, and it was just sort of a direct transference of knowledge, there was intuition involved, there was direct knowledge involved, and there were physical findings through the senses. But the physical senses just kind of locked on that scenario got frozen in time, you were looking at this worm, or this bee, or what would happen if you did this, or if you put a twig in front of its path, what would it do? And you were so intrigued, naturally, truly intrigued, without bias, you just were curious. And something opened up because time froze, your senses froze in on that moment. And now the, the senses just became the static telephones on each end of the line for the communication to happen, for the direct knowledge, the perception, the intuitive understanding to dawn. That's a much more direct way to know things. And that's where then findings and hypotheses come from, like people like Albert Einstein and stuff and Tesla, who were able to tap into that state of imagination or consciousness, um, a deeper state of consciousness that was aware of its own biases and was able to freeze that from time to time. And then based on those direct intuitive insights, they started to formulate it in a way that the physical senses could agree with or the intellect could agree with, but the knowledge was direct. It was said that Tesla could perfectly construct a device at its first go because he could see the whole thing in his mind. And he tried all the different ways. So that when he made something, it was right, right away. Stuff like that, like those faculties of knowledge open up. If only we use the power to know in a different way. And we're not so ignorantly immediately fooled and impressed by our senses and our assumptions and our belief systems and what the world also agrees with and stuff. So if we apply the power to know back onto itself, the power to know, the power to know, if we know the power to know, repeatedly, repeatedly, a whole avenue of direct perception opens up, that the materialistically oriented scientists will never get access to as for as long as they insist or find pride or gratification in their biased way of finding out things. So spirituality is science, it's the new science. It's always been science. The other stuff is just a stone age of science. But we pride ourselves in calling it reality and real. And the other stuff which we don't understand, we automatically dismiss often. I have a question about what you would define as real versus what a scientist would ref define as real. I would define as real direct experience. Now, the tricky thing is, a sense perception comes closer to direct experience than a conceptual assessment about the sense perception, mm. right? But it's not yet direct experience. So what I mean by that is like, if I touch this table, and I just stay present with that sensation, and the visual of it, that is a more that's closer to direct experience, therefore truth, than whatever I could write on a piece of paper about that. Does it make sense? Yeah. So there's, there's degrees of moving away from the truth of reality of direct experience, and into this sort of conceptual imaginary framework, which might have valid descriptions of the real thing. But the map is not the territory. Mm -hmm. And it's very easy to forget this as a human mind, that the map is not the territory. We may know it, we may remember it sometimes, but we act completely forgetting it, lost in a world of concepts for most of our day, thinking, assuming, thinking, assuming, so many assumptions in the back of our minds that we never realize we have. And that completely filter our experience and allow us to only perceive this much of existence and believe it is the world and that it actually exists and that we're visitors to reality, which is the world, but it's complete make believe. Everything we've ever experienced is an imagination, an experience, a subset of a projection of direct experience of the power to know. So closer than the conceptual framework would be 
staying closer to the direct experience of the senses, for example, or of the intuition, or of whatever faculty of knowing we do, but the senses isn't a good example, because people can relate to it. So me touching this table is more real than me describing to you something about me touching the table mm -hmm. or my findings. That's more conceptual. It's farther away in the realm of projection. Mm -hmm. It's it's farther removed from the source of the projection. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, but it's not yet direct, me touching this table, often people think, oh, that's direct experience. And that's kind of the beginning stages of mindfulness where that comes in. It's like, oh, feel your breath. Mm -hmm. Come back to direct experience. Mm. Right. Oh, okay. there's, there's greater peace. Why? Because you're getting closer to the source mm -hmm. of life, which is extremely peaceful and perfect. Reality is perfect. Perfection. The closer we are to reality, the more we experience perfection, like total perfection. So when we relax our thinking mind, our conceptual projections, and we come back to the projection of our senses and our immediate environment and our breath and our body, we call it becoming more present, which is not necessarily inaccurate. But we then still assume that this is direct experience. Like, no, I directly experienced the apple falling from the tree because I saw it with my own eyes. I directly experienced the table because I touched it with my hands and I saw it with my own eyes and I heard the sound. Again, major assumption. All I really know is images, sensation, and sound. But none of these is the table. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. So I can see light, or so we assume. <laughs> and then where I position that in my mind as having the location of being over here, and then I bring my hand, my other faculty of knowing things, which is sensing, feeling. Now I feel it and I hear it while I rub the table. So all of this produces the image, the assumption in my mind that there's an actual table, but I've never experienced the table. Nobody has ever experienced an object. That's one step further. But to start with one example, you have never experienced a table. Right, because all that, all that same stuff mm -hmm. could happen in a dream, right? Like mm -hmm. your mind can make any of that up. Yeah, you can hear a table in a dream, you can see a table in a dream, you can touch a table in a dream. But did you experience a table? Right. You have ears in your dream, or so you assume you have eyes in your dream. So you assume you can touch people, you can make love with them, you can have arguments with them. But did you really experience the people? So me saying, okay, now I'm directly experiencing the table is another assumption. And this is why people don't want to go there because it's scary, right? <laughs> well, then what happens to my world if I take this any farther? Well, it disappears. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Deal with it. But what reveals itself is existence. This is why the true scientist cool. is the most courageous entity imaginable, because they're actually interested in the truth and not assuming. That's why I call the sages, the true scientists, and they're very, very rare, very few and far in between. So now, so then even more direct, more scientific than saying I experienced the table would be to say, I experienced sensation, which I labeled table, I experienced sensation, I experienced color and shape. And then I kind of put them together. And I labeled I called that I used language, I used my conceptual brain function, to then assume to call it, I am touching a table. That's that'd be even more direct, right? Less assumption, because I'm not saying mm. there is a table. Mm -hmm. I'm saying I experienced sensation, sight, and I experienced the thought or label of mm -hmm. the table, the assumption, I experienced the assumption. So now I'm even more direct in my experience. But that's still not direct experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so fun. And you only know it's a table because you were taught that as a child. Also, nice. 
Well, yeah, you, so we assume it's a table mm -hmm. because that's what we, the label we've been taught, yeah. So what would be more direct than that? Like, how, why is me saying I experienced a thought table, mm -hmm. I experienced sensation, and I experienced visual imagery? Why is that still an assumption? I still have to talk about it. I still have to memorize it. I still have to refer back to it. I still have to conceptualize it. It's not my present experience. But neither is the stable now, even though it's now here. Neither is my thought about the table. Basically, the now itself, if you can strip it entirely naked from all assumption. Indeed, the world of the senses and the thinking mind disappears. And what remains? is the direct knowledge, the direct perception, the direct experience of directly experiencing, of direct experience. The only true direct experience is the awareness of awareness. Everything else is one step removed from that reality into projection, into assumption. All you can ever truly say, and I know people are not going to get this right away, but maybe take it on faith to some degree and try it out. The deeper you go and investigate, what am I actually experiencing? Eventually, all that remains is I am. All that remains is I am. And then even that assumption goes. That's the final stage. <laughs> even that experience disappears. And then, then there is true infinite reality. Because you see, the entire illusion, or what people call the world or creation, the entire world of experiences, of phenomenal experiences, they're all rooted in the I am, in the direct experiencer, in the knower. So when the knower knows the knower directly, without any external means, without secondary instruments, when the instrument of knowledge knows itself directly, without assumption of the body, because you've never experienced your body either. That's an assumption as well, if you're honest. But this boggles people's minds, like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. I experience my body all day long. And actually, no, you've never experienced your body. And it's like, either they think I'm completely nuts, or they have sort of maybe even a little bit of a scare moment, like, uh, something in me understands that, oh, holy fuck, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't want to go there, right? Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. fine, you should take it slowly, at a pace you can integrate this deconstruction of what you think is reality. But if you want to know reality, you have to deconstruct everything you assume. That's why there's not a lot of true scientists out there, because who wants this? There's no payoff to the mind, to the ego. But the payoff is infinite bliss, the infinite bliss of reality, knowing itself, the infinite perfection. Reality is perfection. It's beyond description, it's beyond the mind, it's beyond the senses, it's beyond the illusion of the body and the world. It exists on its own, eternally, infinitely, beyond time and space. And it is one infinite, absolute, self-comprehensive reality. And when you have that direct experience beyond even the direct experiencer, beyond, beyond even the assumption of I am, the base, the root assumption out of which all other assumptions and projections and experiences appear, the main, ex the first experience and the constant experience we have when we have any other experience is I am, is consciousness, is the knower. When even that goes, I mean, and here we're already talking about the, the second type of enlightenment. The first type of enlightenment, which is more commonly referred to and understood, is that the I am knows itself. I am that I am. My interpretation of the quote, I am that I am, is a statement of not I am that I am, mm -hmm. which is also a great pointer, but it's actually a statement of what I actually am. It is I am the very fact that I exist. The fact that I am mm -hmm. is what I am. I That's am cool. that I am, oh, nice. right? And people have tried to put commas here and commas there. And like, what was the sentence? Mm -hmm. I am 
the fact, the experience of being. That's what I am. I am that I am, not I am that mm -hmm. I am. I am that I am. Mm -hmm. That I am is what I am. So that is enlightenment for all intents and purposes. That is going back to the unified, most original experience possible. And then before that, you go beyond experiencing. If you go beyond that, you go beyond all experiencing, you go beyond consciousness, you go beyond the root, that which is responsible for every experience, for all of the experience of what we call manifestation. And the entire manifestation disappears when the I am disappears. It already begins to disappear when the I am knows itself, because it's no longer focused on its projections, it's focused on the light of the projector. And if you were to turn around and look into the light of the projector, you might still see some of the images. But if you go deeper into the light, you see just the light. You no longer see Tom Cruise running around at top speed for five minutes. You only see the light, you see the substratum. Now you see the essence of life itself. You know, life itself, every manifestation has at its root, this power of knowing that is enlightenment. Absolute final realization is where even that light disappears. And the infinite uncaused unborn reality that's beyond all experiencing, somehow, mysteriously comprehends itself as infinite perfection, where there is no other. It's not alone. Well, it is alone, but not as in lonely. It, it's infinite. Mm -hmm. Oneness, it's itself I, I cannot be described, because it's not an experience. <laughs> you see, so but the first step, the first distortion of that original absolute reality is the first illusion is consciousness, or I am. Then we get thoughts and feelings and so forth. And this is all there's all an organization to this, there's an evolutionary impulse to this, there's a hierarchy to this that is intelligently designed by this intelligence, which is sentient. So that's why people have called it God. Once they've disidentified from God, they call it God. But it's really the I am that I am is God. So that intelligence can be known directly can be felt for lack of a better word, experience it directly. That is direct experience. That's the closest to the absolute true reality that we can get with the faculty of consciousness. And we cannot get beyond it without first passing through the door of I am. So reality is absolute, infinite, indescribable perfection, not ever appeared anywhere as an experience, not born. It's therefore the source of all that is. The second closest thing to reality is the root of all that is, which is the I amness or that God consciousness. All of this can be accessed directly, not through any physical instrument within the illusion of your assumption of having a body observing things. So if you want to know life, you have to study life, not the world, very different. What is life? Life is that which is alive. What is alive? Our instruments are not alive. I am alive. Investigate the I sense, the sense, the feeling that everyone has, every baby has it, the feeling of I. I am. Go to that feeling, that direct experience. It will consume your world. It will reveal it to be a flawless appearance, an illusion of the light of consciousness. And then you can go even beyond that in time with practice. And know the reality before any creation ever appeared. So then you also know what was before the Big Bang and what will be after the entire dissolution of this cosmic dance. Of vibrations and thoughts. And I try to describe this actually in my latest book, which is kind of a fun, uh, kind of plugs into this. We had a dialogue with a friend, a few dialogues. So it's called uh, Spiritual Conversations with a Skeptic. Mm -hmm. I recommend people check it out. It's a fun read. That's a great book for this topic. Mm -hmm. So you might have already addressed this, but Maybe there's a nuance in addition. So for somebody who's starting on this, say a scientist who wants to start investigating um, more directly, more act, more in the direction of what is aware, how, what is the scientific mindset? Like what is the scientific mindset for somebody who wants to pursue this? 
nice first step is to humble yourself. Know that your entire list of findings is based on the assumption of a reality that exists apart from your direct experience. Know this to be an assumption entirely. So go look for your assumptions. What am I assuming right now? And you'll find the list is near endless. But as you find the list is endless, the momentum of your humility and your earnestness and your direct your ability to directly know life also increases and it kind of swallows up those delusions with this sort of energetic momentum of consciousness knowing itself. So it, it's like this light of the sun is led in more and more, and it just evaporates the mist of all these assumptions. That's what we call the enlightenment. So first step would be to know that you don't know, you just thought you did. And to be ready for that, like, are you willing to face that? If you're not, don't pretend you're doing this practice, because you'll just distort it more and use it for your ego and pride and gra emotional gratification and social security and status and all that. So don't even start if you cannot be completely comfortable and excited about the inquiry, what am I actually assuming and everything that I think I know is just that. I don't know, I think I know to shift from I think I know, and believing in that to knowing that you think you know, is, is a magnificent first step into peace, truthfulness, sincerity, humility, uh, ego death. And then that will take you down the rabbit hole of truth. And what's the relationship there between I don't know, in this context, and then how you're saying what we have? Well, the only thing we know is that I know. Nice. So the only thing we do know, which again, is this consciousness, which is this being, this is being aware, this power to know, is all we actually know, it's constantly with us, without it, we couldn't have this dialogue. Without it, you can understand any of your findings about life, without it, you can have any of your assumptions be known to you. You only know what you think you know, because you know. So what you know, is that you know, what you are is that you are. Can I say one thing about this, mm -hmm. this, there's a test that you've done, that has helped me see this really clearly, which is just try to not know. Nice. Which I it didn't, it was hard to access that until I tried not to know. Cool. cool. Continue. Mm. Yep. Try not to know. Or try not to be aware right now. Try not to exist. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. So then you come back to that primary knowledge of life, which is the I exist. And those are words, consciousness, awareness, being aware, the power to know, the essence of life itself, sentience, aliveness, cognizance, clarity, space like awareness or consciousness, I am, I exist, beingness, God, isness, those are all words that are empty and meaningless, but they try to point to the direct experience that you're having right now of existing and being aware. The more you can lock onto that inability to not know, the more you can lock onto I know, not this or that, but I know that I know, I know that I know that I don't know things. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. that I know that I think I know things, but I don't, for sure. I don't know things for sure, I'm assuming. That's that sort of bridging humility that's required to become a true scientist. Up to that point, you're just a religious nut, confirming your own belief systems, mm -hmm. applying quantum mechanics without knowing it and without investigating it. So you don't qualify as a scientist even if uh, the rest of the world thinks you are, it doesn't still doesn't make you a scientist per definition, you're not a scientist. Per my definition, anyway. Mm -hmm. One thing I love about this is I do think in the scientific community, there's, um, there is sort of like a, a culture of humility, like they at least see themselves as humble. Um, so like, you'll see a lot of scientists claim early in the beginning of a study or a report that they've, here are my biases. But I don't think I've ever seen a scientist claim the bias that consciousness creates matter. 
Like I've never seen that. That matter creates consciousness. Right, right. The bias that matter creates consciousness. Mm -hmm. Like those implicit biases, those inherent ones that nobody questions. Right. They form the background of all our delusions. Right. And our findings. Yeah. Yeah. No, there is great humility also in the scientific community. And most of the hubris or arrogance that I point to, and it's just, it's out of love, honestly, it's to point them to that as a wake up call. So if someone hears this and like, fuck, yes, that does match me. Great. Um, It's not to say that that assumption is not innocent, right? So we have, we are arrogant in so many ways. And for the most part, it's innocent arrogance. It's just because we don't know any better. It's because we haven't investigated because we think this is the way things work. So I don't mean to point fingers in that way. I do mean to point fingers (laughs) at the patterns, at the biases, but not at the essence of the entity. Um, It's not a judgment of the essence of the entity. It's just a judgment of the approach being flawed and we need to investigate it. Otherwise we're contradicting what we say we are and nobody wants that Mm. because then we're no longer respectable in our own eyes. Mm. It's called honor. So, which yeah, sometimes just seems to be lacking a little bit, but I try to wake that up. But yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot of scientists be on a service level, at least really humble, but it is that main bias. That's why I say it's the bridge. Yeah, between nice. limited science and evolved science or expanded science or true, truer science, fuller science. The bridge is to look at the assumption that all of your findings are founded on, which is that there is a physical reality or even a reality outside of consciousness, outside of your power to know. And you've never experienced it. It's never been proven. So, that those are the root assumptions that form the entire backbone and background of all our efforts. So we, if we want to reach deeper, we want to know life, we have to investigate that. The best way to investigate it is to become disgruntled with it. And that's why I use more strong language sometimes like this is stupid. <laughs> it's because hopefully the contrasting nature of that mm-hmm. to those who are open to it will kind of wake them up like, oh, fuck, yeah. But it's not a judgment. And yeah, there is great sincerity also in the scientific community. Um, and most of the arrogance there is innocent, it's ignorant. But hopefully, if they see this, it's a little more aware of that ignorance. Mm-hmm. And then they can really, my, my core desire is for them to liberate themselves from this illusion, from this dream, and from the illusions of pride and temporary emotional gratification and peer pressure and socially acceptable status. And it's no way to live, in my opinion. It's no way to f- feel and know life. So actually, the scientist who claims to be about life, I want them to know life. And I just know that um, the way that they're assuming things at a fundamental level is blinding them from the truth that they're actually, actually looking for within the depths of their heart. So true scientist is a lover, a lover of life. And you need courage, you need faith. Faith is different than religion, though. It's typical science is religious. Faith, the ability to therefore move through the investigations and dismantle your illusions requires faith in call it something bigger in reality in life itself. So you can be a faithful, full of faith person, and not as religious as you were before you had faith. Faith in what? Before you had faith, that you were held in a presence of life itself, and that no matter what you would find, if you were honest and investigated and deconstructed all your biases, that what you would end up with is actually benevolent, it's actually life itself. It is what you really are. Mm. Faith in that, that there's more than meets the eye, that there's more than the senses perceive and so forth. The typical, or maybe it's not typical, but um, the sort of materialistic end of the spectrum of scientists, they typically lack faith, right? And they claim that those that portray faith are religious. Sometimes they say that. But again, they, this, those scientists are more religious, because they're living based on belief and assumption. And those that have faith can, some are highly religious, like they're highly just under the spell of a belief system and not investigating scientifically. But there's people that very highly 
directly investigate that have a lot of faith in life, faith, some that this indescribable quality of I just know it's possible. I just know I'm okay, no matter what faith, without being religious, whereas the scientific person without faith is more religious, because it religiously believes in what it believes in. Whereas the one who has a lot of faith is now freeing themselves up to investigate those assumptions and those religious beliefs. Mm. Do you want the blue pill or the red pill? The blue pill is religion, the red pill is faith. Even if that religion expresses itself in scientific fashion, or scientific status, or scientific approach, but it's still the blue pill, it's still religious. It's not the truth, it's not life itself. The red pill requires great faith in something other than what you know. But it's not religious, because it takes you down the path of direct investigation, like direct investigation of the root of all phenomena, which is the knower. Consciousness is all you've ever known and been. Everything else is assumption, it's inferred, it's referred to, it's memorized, it's thought of, it's made up, it's projected, it's assumed. Believing in what you're projecting is religion not believing in it, but investigating the root of it is science and requires faith. True science requires faith. False science is religious, it requires no faith. The less faith you have, the more religious you are. The more faith you have, true faith, the more scientific you become. Oh, that's so paradoxical from what people would associate with faith. Mm -hmm. So do you think the more faithful you are, or the more faith you have, I suppose, the more objectively you can see, the less biased you are? Absolutely. Really? Yes. Because you have to understand what I mean by faith. It's to not, it's, it's to be so courageous. You have to, you have to have faith in something yeah. to investigate your beliefs mm -hmm. to the point of destruction, disillusion. You won't do that if you don't have faith in something deeper. So you see, you need faith in ultimately in your true self, in order to become unreligious, to become a true scientist. It's not faith in an idea, mm -hmm. although it can start out that way to give you courage to dissolve one idea, to sort of become more direct in your experience, as we've, you know, demonstrated earlier. So you need faith to even want to do that, because without that faith, you're just going to focus on what you already know and try to make the best of that, mm -hmm. take, the, take the blue pill. Red, taking the red pill took faith for Neo, it's like, hmm. and a certain disgruntlement with his reality and the knowledge somehow that there's more. That's faith, that's not religious. Religious is when you put symbols into the mix and you stop investigating and you assume things. Mm -hmm then it's religious. That's why most of science is religious, because it assumes that there's a reality apart from direct experience or consciousness. And they never experience that, but they talk about it as if it's real. And they reinforce it and they want everyone else to, no, maybe not, but they kind of portray it as mm -hmm. like, oh, this is the reality. The good thing about science is that it's true, whether you agree with it or not, right? That's right. a funny statement. Yeah. <laughs> That's why spirituality equals true faith equals true science in my book. Mm -hmm. Take it or leave it. <laughs> um. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Mirror Talks podcast with Bentinho Massaro. If you love these teachings and you want full access to almost all of Bentinho's recorded material, go to bentinomassaro.tv. Right now, we're offering a free seven-day trial with unlimited access to everything on BentinoMassaro.tv, including curated playlists, guided meditations, and much more. This is our number one recommendation for you. As a subscriber, you'll get first access to these podcast episodes two weeks before they go public. You'll also get access to exclusive Q&As with Bentinho and other content only available to subscribers of BentinoMassaro.tv. Also, Bentinho recently created a free online global enlightenment retreat. It's eight long form sessions that coherently guide you through the foundation of his enlightenment teachings. You can watch the free online global enlightenment retreat at BentinoMassaro.tv or on YouTube. 
If you're interested in the most current and complete overview of Bentinho's work to date, this is where we recommend you start. Another great resource is Trinfinity Academy, Bentinho's free online school for enlightenment, empowerment, and infinity. Each class is concise and clear and distills one key topic at a time, including homework. We strongly recommend you check out Trinfinity Academy if you want to master the mechanics of Bentinho's teachings. Finally, don't underestimate the value of sharing this episode with the people who came to mind as you were watching or listening. It's a service to them and the collective, and it's also the best thing you can do to support us in getting this message far and wide. We also encourage you to like, subscribe, and leave positive reviews and ratings on your preferred platforms, and follow Bentinho on social media, especially Instagram. Thank you 